Awesome, man. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for church this morning. I want to say a special thank you to all of our friends and volunteers who helped invite folks for last Easter weekend. Man, we had close to 5,000 folks rolling through the pursuit for that day. Absolutely incredible. God's doing an incredible work here in the Northwest. And I know so many of you invited friends and family. Some of you invited people you don't even like, and they showed up. And so, uh, man, we're just so appreciative of that. Actually, this Sunday is one of my favorite Sundays, for on this day, we are welcoming all of our new members in person as they join themselves to this local church. Yeah, we do this on like a quarterly basis, and we invite folks in, and I really think of membership as what separates the tire kickers from the car buyers. People who say, Pastor, I got skin in the game. I'm not just here to observe. I'm here to participate. I'm a part of this thing. And together, we're going to build the house of God in the Northwest. And so in just a moment, I'm going to call you forward. If you fill out one of our membership forms online, anytime between this Sunday and the last time that we did a membership introduction, we want to pray over you this morning. We want to confess the truth of Christ over your life this morning. And in doing so, welcome you as a part of our ever-growing and expanding family here all across the region. If that's you in this place this morning, would you make your way forward to the stage? We're going to go ahead and welcome you and honor you this morning. We've got a special gift for you. And we're going to be excited to have you joining us here as a church family. Come on, Pursuit. We can do better than that. Come on, can we honor and welcome? This is important. Come on, I want you to see this today. This is not normal. Yeah, yeah. No, this is the part of God stirring in people's hearts and lives all across the Northwest. It's just incredible. We got a special gift. Special gift for all of our new members. It's actually one of our Pursuit branded puzzle pieces. And it it's a prophetic reminder that you have a part to play in the building of God's house. This is the way the Apostle Paul says it. He says, we are living stones being built together for the furtherance of God's kingdom. And you got a part to play, you got a gift to give, you've got a family to call your own. I love the local church, I love God and his work and what he's doing here in this community. And standing in front of you today represents lives and family members and friends who are now pledging their affiliation and their allegiance to the high call of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so, so excited. And we're gonna read a confession together this morning. Yeah, awesome. Hey, if you got your puzzle piece, let's lift those up in the air. Awesome, awesome. If I can get the, the, the declaration on the screen, awesome, perfect. On the screen to your left or right, we're going to read this together. Uh, if the audience wants to read too, you're welcome to. But hey, everybody up front, man, I'm so proud of you guys. So awesome. Let's go for it. Here we go. Today, I formally join myself to the Pursuit Church family for the express purpose of growth, development, community, and service. I don't have to come to church. I get to come to church. I don't have to give. I get to give. I don't have to serve, I get to serve. I am not a consumer, I am a contributor. I believe my best days are ahead and I have a part to play in this local church. I will honor the house of God by fighting for unity in this church because this church belongs to Christ. I am committed to a pursuit of the presence of God and his transformative work both in me and through me. I am a bringer, I am a builder, and today I become a member of this house. I commit to the these things in Jesus name amen awesome let's give it up for our new members welcoming them into the house of God so exciting now let me read this over you this morning and now I charge you before God and men pursue righteousness godliness faith love endurance and gentleness fight the good fight of the faith take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. And to Jesus, who is alone, immortal, and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might in the church both now and forever. Amen and amen. Come on, one more time. Let's welcome our new family members here at Pursuit. You guys can be seated. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah.
Yeah, I think we have close to uh, uh, 65 who've also filled out membership online from all across the nation. And so we want to say a special welcome and thank you to all of our online family watching really from across the world uh, as they're peering in with interest to some of what God is doing here in the Northwest. I say this all the time, but if God can do it here, yeah. he can do it anywhere. And so the Northwest is really like a, a proof, proof text. It's, 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 a, it's a classic example of God's faithfulness to his people. And I know that the Northwest seems to be one of the hardest areas to reach and one of the least church areas in the nation. Uh, but if God can do it in Snohomish, it tells me that there is still a king in Israel. There is still a God who is worthy and there's still one who is pouring out his spirit without measure on those who ask. And uh, we're just excited to uh, be a part of that. Hey, we wanna let you know that coming up on May 1st at 6 p.m. is our first ever Seattle preview service. We're gonna be hosting that right in the Ballard area. Uh, located in Seattle, uh, Washington. We're going to be at the historic Ballard Elks Lodge. And uh, it's just going to be an incredible time uh, in the presence of God as we're rallying folks really from across the region to be a part of this next step of God's faithfulness here to this local church. In just a moment, we're going to show you a short video clip and give you a little bird's eye tour of what that facility looks like. But I'm going to encourage you to mark your calendars and join us. Uh, in just a few weeks as we rally in Seattle for our first ever preview service. Why don't we roll that video this morning? Hey friends, Pastor Russell here. Hey, I am on location at our building rental for our Seattle preview service coming May 1st at 6 p.m. And right behind me is the historic Ballard Elks Lodge. It's got incredible parking and incredible view of the water. We're gonna be rallying the region for revival, for prayer, for worship. Why don't you join us? Would you invite a friend? We got a special gift for our first 500 guests and we would love to see you there May 1st, 6 p.m for our Seattle preview service. I'll see you real soon. And hey, we're gonna go ahead and make one more uh, announce this, uh, announcement this morning. We told the first service, but I figure I'll tell you guys as well. Uh, starting uh, here on May 8th, May 8th, which is Mother's Day, we're launching one more service here at The Pursuit. We're changing our service times. <laughs> We're going to be going 8 a.m., 9.15, 10.30, 11.45, and uh, 1 p.m. I tell people this all the time, but as long as there's a family who has not yet been reached by the gospel in the Northwest, there is a reason for the church to grow. And so I'm going to ask you to invite friends, pick a service that you're going to be a part of, show up on time, even get here early if you'd like a seat or a parking spot. But we're going to make more room in the house of God because God is sending folks really from across the region, even before... I got up uh, uh, to, 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 to preach at this service. I got a text from somebody in Mississippi. And they said, Pastor, I already outlined my Google Maps journey. I'm driving up for a pursuit service. It is one day and 13 hours of driving to get here. And uh, I just figured, man, if we got folks coming from Mississippi, then certainly we got folks all across this region who have yet to find a church family to call their own. And so there is a reason for this local house to continue to grow. And so it is not an inconvenience. I know it's more work and it will require more volunteer teams and more people who got servant hearts here in the house of God. But we're just excited to create more room in the wineskin. If we do, God will send the wine. That is his pattern. And uh, we're just going to encourage you to be a part and pay attention to some of the scheduling changes that are coming up here uh, real soon. Hey, this morning I'm going to share with you uh, out of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, and in doing so, uh, shift your attention to what God would be doing in this moment for our community and encourage you to be a part of it. 2 Kings 4. Starting in verse 1, the Bible records this story. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he feared the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Hear me, friends, seasons change, people change, relationships change, environments change, and no matter how well-adjusted we think we are, none of us truly loves when things change. Think about this, the next time somebody is sitting in your seat when you walk into the sanctuary, everybody likes change until it happens to them. And here's the reason why, change equals loss, loss equals pain, but pain equals growth. 
and the threshold of your pain, in fact, is the threshold of your growth. So choose wisely before giving up in the middle of your pain. Here's what I found to be true. Healthy things grow and growing things change. A people who hate change kill their own ability for progress. I'm not sure who said it, but it bears repeating. Growth is painful. Change is painful. But nothing is as painful as staying stuck somewhere you don't belong. Think about the temptation of a parent to look on a newborn baby and wish that they would never age. Simply because they are so cute or precious at the stage they are at. But a baby who doesn't grow isn't a blessing, it's a nightmare. Watch what the Bible says. Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Joshua 1, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. John 12, unless a seed goes into the ground and first dies, it produces no good thing. Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Luke 17, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he will find it. See, some things have to die in order for other things to live. But so often we hold on to the way things were because we prefer the comfort of the familiar over the pain of necessary growth. Watch, the death of this woman's husband caused her to place a demand on what only God could provide. And sometimes God in his grace removes the things that you wanted to reveal the things that you have needed. And until God becomes your supply, no amount of money will ever be enough. Until God becomes your supply, no amount of emotional validation will ever be enough. Until God becomes your supply, no amount of sexual encounters will ever be enough. Until God becomes your supply, you won't ever be satisfied by what man provides. It's a tragedy that we look to people to provide what only God can grant. But see, friend, today you can be content right where you're at because God is your supply. In fact, the most attractive thing a person can offer is contentment right where they're at. For Paul says in Philippians 4 and verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty, but I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Hear me, friend, it's not that God shows up in the middle of our loss. It is not that God shows up in the middle of our loss. It's that often our loss clears out the clutter that has prevented us from recognizing that God has been there all along. In verse 2, the Bible says this, So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And see, in that culture, oil was essential in the baking of bread. It was also essential in the usage of lanterns. It was also regularly used as ointment and medicines. It was also regularly used in religious ceremonies. See, nobody appreciates a standalone ingredient. Nobody goes home on a Sunday afternoon craving a spoonful of baking powder. But it's a necessary ingredient if you want the dough to rise. You know why church is so important? Because you got ingredients on your shelf that I don't have on mine. And I bet if we take our oil and our flour and our baking soda, our salt, our yeast, our water, and our sugar, we could mix it together and see miracles all across this region. The ingredients for the miracle are already in the house but it is our job to bring the vessels. I think of a little bit of oil like I think about a little bit of faith. It doesn't seem extraordinary at the time, but it is the basic ingredient for spiritual bread, spiritual light, physical healing, and spiritual consecration. And if all you got is a mustard seed of faith, you are the most dangerous thing to the enemy's camp. Well, I've got nothing but a little bit of faith, and that's enough for God to work with. You might feel like you got no faith this morning, but you're here. And that tells me you got enough faith to see God intervene in your life. Watch, God sends a prophet to ask two questions. What do you want and what do you have? 
And I think every great work of God in your life starts with those two questions. What do you want? And what do you have? And why would God ask you that question before performing a miracle in your life? I think the reason is because he desires your participation over your observation any day of the week. It's why the little boy had to give his five loaves and two fishes. It's why Naaman had to go wash in the river. It's why the lepers had to go show themselves to the priest. It's why Peter has to get out of the boat. It's why you get to be a part of serving and tithing. It's why you get to pray and encourage. It's why you get to worship and sing because the miracle you participate in will always be more impactful than the miracle you simply observe. And that's why I invite you to participate here. Church isn't the place we go where we watch someone we hired be spiritual on our behalf. Church is a pillar in the life of a believer because there are things that will happen in the sacred context of this community that become cornerstones in the building of your life. And that's why when Jesus was talking about the kingdom in Luke 17, the Bible says that Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. In verse 3 of 2 Kings 4, the story continues. Elisha said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. From all of your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. And then you will pour it into all those vessels and you will set aside the full ones. I want you to recognize the request of Elisha. He didn't say ask for oil. He said ask for vessels. Hear me, friend, you can't ask for a blessing if you don't have a vessel to hold it. What if instead of asking for a spouse, you ask God to make you the type of vessel that can properly honor whoever God brings you? What if instead of just asking God for more money, you asked him to make you a vessel of wisdom to steward whatever he gives you next? What if you are only seeing 10% of the miracle because instead of bringing vessels, you've been complaining about the little oil that you got left? See, I got to build in the Northwest because I know the principles of God. There is seed time and then there is harvest. There is sowing and then there is reaping. There is building and then there is occupying. No, we're going to build all across this region because if we will grab vessels, God will be faithful to fill them. God doesn't fill in theory. He fills in practice, which means I I've got to give God something to work with. Ask for every empty vessel that could hold oil. Bring it into the house and begin to pour out what you've got. The miracle matriculated as the widow was obedient to pour. As she poured out, God poured in. As she was faithful with little, God gave her increase. Oh, that has been my prayer for this region. God, give me every vessel that was meant to carry oil, but instead has been collecting dust, and I'll take the little I have and I'll pour it out. Give me every empty wineskin that was meant to carry wine, but instead has become a relic to the past, and I'll take the little I have left and I'll pour it out. God, give me every empty church building that was meant to be filled with life but instead has become a storage facility for dead dreams and I'll take the little that I have left and pour it out. (laughs) Friend, as long as there are vessels to fill, God will be faithful to provide. No, grab everyone you know. It's revival time in the Northwest. Go into the highways and the byways because there is an open invitation to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Now watch, watch. So she went from him and she shut the door behind her, her and her sons. And they brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels was full that she said to her son, bring me another. In April of 1945, at the height of World War II, The Navy's 5th Fleet and more than 180,000 U.S. Army and Marine Corps troops descended on the Pacific Island of Okinawa, Japan, in order to capture a strategic landmass in an attempt to turn the tide of the war. In order to accomplish this mission, U.S. troops would need to scale an imposing vertical rock face nicknamed Hacksaw Ridge, which the Japanese were fiercely defending. 
Amongst the soldiers working to capture Okinawa Island was a man by the name of Desmond Doss. Now, Doss was an unusual sight on the battlefield because Doss was a conscientious objector. Meaning, because of a deeply held religious conviction, Doss would not carry a gun. Instead, he would only focus on helping the wounded. Doss was routinely abused by fellow soldiers for refusing to fight. His superiors even attempted to court-martial him, but Doss simply refused to leave. He was more than happy to serve. He simply just objected to carrying a weapon. And on April 29th, on a cold and dark evening in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Doss and his fellow soldiers would scale a 400-foot-high jagged cliff and find themselves faced by some of the fiercest fighting the war had yet to see. On that day, 500 of the 800 men in Doss's battalion became casualties of war. 36 ships were sunk. 368 ships were damaged, 4,900 men were killed, and 763 aircraft were destroyed. In the midst of chaos, human casualty, and carnage, Doss defied the orders of his commanders to retreat and instead begin taking immediate action to save the wounded and the dying. Even though his fellow soldiers withdrew from the battlefield, Doss waited till dusk to rescue as many of the wounded as he could. He secretly crawled on the ground from wounded soldier to wounded soldier. Doss would drag them to the edge of the ridge, tie a rope to their bodies, and lower them to the medics below. Throughout the rescue, there was just one prayer Doss murmured all the time, Lord, please help me get one more. His unwavering courage saved at least 75 lives in the Battle of Okinawa, which was recorded as the bloodiest battle of World War II. After the war, Desmond Doss became the first ever conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor. And on October 12th, 1945, Desmond Doss met then President Harry Truman. At the ceremony, President Truman warmly held the hand of Corporal Desmond Thomas Doss and complimented him saying, I am proud of you, you deserve this, and I consider meeting you a greater honor than being president. Doss died in his sleep on March 23rd, 2006, and today is buried in the National Cemetery in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Friend, I'm here to tell you this morning that it is time to go ahead and get one more. This is the prayer of a church that is perpetually on mission. While others are retreating and cowering in fear, as the church of God runs from Seattle, we are running in. And we are running in with this prayer. God, give us one more. Give us another vessel to fill. Give us another family to touch. Give us another prodigal to come back home. Give us another addicted young person who's going to get free. Give us another individual on the verge of suicide who's coming back to life. God, just help me get one more. Now, I know the conflict and chaos around us seems extreme. I know that culture seems to be teetering on a jagged cliff of its own. But if there has ever been a time for the church to find her courage, friend, it's now. And in verse 7 of 2 Kings 4, the story continues. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts so you and your sons can live on what is left. Hear me, friend. When you don't have oil, you'll sell the next generation right out of your own house just so you can survive. Don't believe me? I see churches do it all the time. See, the oil we've got is so our sons and our daughters can live again. I am not building this church for me. I am building it for them. I am building it so you and your family can live, so you and your business can prosper, so you and your dreams can come alive, so you and your mental health can be healed, so you and your finances can prosper. Friend, oil is a sign of life, and it's being poured out in the Northwest again. Can you imagine what her neighbors would have thought? We know this woman is a widow. We know her destitute condition. We know her extreme poverty. Why on 
earth would she need to borrow vessels from us? Why are you grabbing more jars, widow? We know that you got more trouble than you can even count. Why are you asking us to borrow vessels from our own house when your house is empty? Why are you grabbing more jars? Because there's a prophet in the house who told me I could ask. Why are you loosing that donkey in Jerusalem? Because there's a master on a mission who told me I could ask. Why are you holding your mat on the Sabbath? Because there's a healer in the temple who told me I could dance. Why are you worshiping like that? Because there's a God in heaven who told me I could sing. Why are you rejoicing like that? Because there is a savior on a throne who told me I could live. Friend, I'm telling you, on May 8th, we're going 8 a.m., we're going 9.15 a.m., we're going 10.30 a.m., we're going 11.45 a.m., we're going 1 p.m. in Seattle, we're going 6 p.m. Why? Because the master told me I could ask. We know pursuit is all the way up there in Snohomish. Why do they think they can come to Seattle? <laughs> and we know that person's past. Why do they think that they can be involved like that? We know how expensive buildings are in this market. Why do they think that they can afford that? Because there is a man named Jesus who told me I could ask. And I am asking the one who provides nations as our inheritance. God, give me one more. Give me another campus. Give me another service. Give me another family. Give me another backslider. Give me another young man or young woman in bondage. Give me one more. And for our inheritance, give us vessels all across the Northwest that God would pour out his oil and that he would never stop. Now listen, stay standing. I'm almost done. Hear me, hear me, hear me. I know I'm fired up, but just hear me for a second. I would contend that the most impoverished person in that community was not the widow. It was every other house around her who missed out on the miracle of fresh oil being poured out in her house. Friend, the oil is being poured out. Would you help me grab some vessels? Is this type of God still worthy of this type of sacrifice? Would you help me grab vessels from neighbors' houses? Would you consider joining me on this journey? Would you consider pledging your life in membership? Would you consider laying down your life in service to the king? Would you just consider that the foolishness of God is wiser than the most wisest wisdom of man? Could you just consider this morning that yes, something good can come out of Snohomish. Yes, something good can come out of Seattle. God is not done with his church. He is simply beginning. People say, well, pastor, I'm concerned. And how are you going to have energy? And how are the teams going to come? And I was talking to a banker this week and asking them for money to help fund our building project in Seattle. And they said, well, pastor, how many members do you have in Seattle? I said, zero. They said, how many Sunday morning services have you done in Seattle? Zero. But Paul says that anything that is not from faith is sin. No, I don't have any other option. I'm down to my last drop of oil, but I am convinced that if I will pour it out, he will pour it back. And that's what we're committed to be in this hour because friend, we don't have another option. Revival is not a good idea. It is revival or we die. And so we're gonna rally people to simply believe God at his word. And I don't know where all the finances are gonna come from. And I don't know where all the volunteers are gonna come from. And I don't know how I'm gonna have the strength to do all that, but I know that those who run with the Lord, they will not grow weary. They will not grow faint. They will overcome for we are not victims 
victims of culture's narrative. We are more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. And if you will join me on this journey, we will see God pour out his oil in houses all across this region. We will go from the least church region to one of the most church regions. We will go from spiritual death unto spiritual life. We will go from bondage unto freedom. And God will receive the reward of his suffering. Friend, that's why you're here. Grab every vessel you know. It's revival time in the Northwest. Come on, let me pray for you. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask for fresh oil from heaven to be deposited in our own lives. For those who feel like they're running out and they've only got a little drop left, God, would you fill them afresh and anew? Not with the outpouring from yesterday or yesteryear, but a fresh touch from heaven this morning. God, would you steady us for the journey that is ahead? Would you strengthen our feet? Would you strengthen our mind? And would you strengthen our resolve? We declare that all who hope in the Lord will not be set to disappointments. And so God, we say our eyes are on you. Our hope is anchored above, not below. And we say, if you will be our God, we will be your people. Father, we say, fill this house. We say, God, fill this region. And we say, God, fill this nation with your glory like we have never seen before. We say, Spirit of God, do what no man can do. And we'll give you all the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friend, if you're here today... And you'd like prayer before you'd leave, I'd sure love to add my faith to yours to see God do a miracle in your life. If that's you in this place, you need a miracle in your body, a miracle in your family, you need a fresh anointing from heaven, I'm going to invite you forward. We got prayer team members who would love to partner with you in faith. If not, God bless. Hey, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're going to see a lot of you next Sunday. Why don't you invite a friend? Let's help build the house of God together. We'll see you real soon. God bless.